means the Dhando investor is, you know, it, it uses the Patels and the, their amazing journey with motels, uh, not only in the, in the US, but the Patels have really done well in the UK as well. So I use that as a backdrop to uh, get some principles and perspectives across. But just to, just to clarify, I am not a Patel. I did not grow up in a motel. And I did not have the life experience that's the central theme of the book. I was really a, in, an observer. And I thought that the Patel experience has a lot of commonality with value investing. And so uh, that's why I use that, that as the backdrop, because it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a story that needs to be told more often. And it's, I mean, I think at this point in the U.S., probably something like 70% of the motels in the country are under Patel ownership. And uh, Patels make up, I would guess, less than 0.2% of the US population. So when this 0.2% comes into the country as refugees in the 70s, and then they end up owning 70% of a fairly large industry, it's a peculiar event. And it's a peculiar outcome and it's interesting to study why that happened. And so that's kind of what drove my interest. And the framework that the Patels used to establish uh, their dominance is a very powerful framework. So the Patels had gone to East Africa, Uganda, etc., more than a century ago. And they had gone, they'd been actually taken there as indentured laborers, almost like slaves. But because of their Dhando ways, over a century, they came to control most of the Ugandan economy. So similar type of situation where a very small minority is controlling large swaths of an economy. And in the 70s, when Idi Amin came to power in Uganda, his perspective was that Africa is for Africans. And uh, of course, he's kind of ignored the fact that the Patels were really Africans. They've been there, you know, they were born there, their fathers were born there and so on, but that didn't quite resonate with Idi Amin. So he pretty much confiscated all their assets and gave them like 60 days to leave the country. And uh, so their businesses were taken over and their homes and properties. So Patel pretty much overnight lost everything. And they were stateless because they were Ugandan citizens. They were not citizens of any other country. So Britain put, took in quite a large number of uh, refugees from Uganda. Canada did, did as well. And surprisingly, India refused to allow them to enter. Uh, India was at that time dealing with the Bangladesh refugee crisis. Bangladesh had just been formed, so they really had no appetite for more refugees. And so the United States, under Nixon and Kissinger, uh, took a large number as well. And the Patels were able to convert some of their assets into gold and such, and maybe they got out with five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, and uh, that was it. And the motel business uh, seemed to resonate with them because the first need it satisfied is it gave them housing. So these 10, 20, 30 room motels that were built along in the 50s and 60s as the US industry system got built were a bunch of mom and pops and those folks were getting older and ready to retire and their kids really weren't interested in the motel business. So the first motels who came bought some of these motels and they bought them very highly levered. So usually like kind of these motels at that time, like 50,000, they were like, you know, 10, 20, 30 room type properties in the middle of nowhere, 50,000, 75,000. And the Patels put up like five or 10,000 of cash and the rest was either owner or bank financed. And they put the family in one or two rooms and the motel business is labor intensive. And so the families pretty much worked around the clock and they got rid of all the hired help. And so they were cleaning the rooms and manning the front desk and all of that. And so very quickly, the Patels became low cost providers. 
if there was a Patel owned motel in a particular geography, its operating cost was lower than all the other neighboring hotels because they had no payroll. Payroll was zero. And all the others had hired help. So, but what the Patels would do is they would price the rooms lower than anyone else. So their properties were always almost completely occupied. And while the others, when they tried to match those prices, they would end up either not making money or losing money. So low cost providers gives many businesses a long-term enduring competitive advantage. I mean, we see that with Geico, with Berkshire Hathaway, and, and you see that with Costco and so on. So Walmart and so on. So low cost, well, we'll give you, a, even with Nucor, for example, with their mini mills, uh, low cost gives you a huge advantage. And because they were a low cost provider and because they were, their financials were healthier, as they, and they lived a very basic frugal lifestyle. Most of them were vegetarians. Anyway, they couldn't go out to eat. The 70s in the US, you know, your choices for eating as a vegetarian were very, very limited. So basically they, ate their simple meals, they had their simple rooms in their hotel, so they had no housing costs and their living costs were low. So their savings rate was high. And what they did with the savings was they started to buy more motels. And so the family would take one family member and move them out into another motel. And then that person would get going with that and you know cascade that over time. And it worked well. And the end result is what we see today, which is they completely dominated a, an industry and they took over. So that, that story, I think, has a lot of resonance with value investing. Because in investing, what we are trying to do is we're trying to get an unfair advantage. You know, there is some quirk with some company where they have a, you know, so taking a step back, capitalism is brutal. It's a dog eat dog world. And one of the things you may enjoy is there is a video on YouTube, which was, I think maybe put up five or six years ago. And the title of that video is competition is for losers. And I think you guys will enjoy that video. It was, it's a video recording of Peter Thiel teaching a class at Stanford Business School. He used to teach a class on startups and entrepreneurship. And I think the video has got a huge view count and I think it's an excellent video. I don't know whether Peter Thiel would like that video out there now because he's become somewhat you know, notorious. But what Peter, what Peter says is that if you look at most businesses or almost all businesses, you can put them in two categories around the planet. There are a small sliver of businesses which are basically monopolies or oligopolies, and they have very strong competitive advantages. And then there's an overwhelming majority of businesses which are basically really tough businesses to be in. And so 99% of capitalism is these really tough businesses, and maybe 1% or less is these you know, monopolies or you know, somehow, somehow insulated business. And Peter's point to his, his students was that there is no point following the masses of capitalists and either working at or founding a business that is dealing with all these competitive forces. We want to be sitting there with monopolies and that's how we make a lot of money. And I think in investing too, basically what you're looking for is some kind of an edge that the business has that is an enduring edge. And if you can invest in a business with has that edge at a reasonable price, good things will happen to you. So that was basically the genesis of the Dhandu investor and why I use the Patels and so on as my foil, if you will. That 